Hi, I'm Chuck Taylor. The documentary you're about to see, Decade of Discontent, first aired in 1981. We wanted to start a dialogue between blacks and whites over social issues that were causing a great deal of discontent and suffering in Milwaukee's black community. We felt the best way to do this was to take a look back at the civil rights movement that took place in this city during the 60s. Today, as we enter the mid-90s, the problems that this documentary unveil still challenge our society. As I stand on the James Groppy Bridge, named in honor of the former priest who was a central figure in the Milwaukee civil rights movement, it seems fitting that we reintroduce our documentary, Decade of Discontent, to a new generation. Then we're going to walk on our ankles and on our knees. Employment, equal educational opportunity, open housing, and police community relations were the key issues facing Milwaukee's black citizens during the 60s. Before we concentrate on these issues, it's important to take a look back at the role blacks have played historically in the state of Wisconsin. Long before Wisconsin was established as a state, blacks played a significant but historically unrecognized role in developing the territory. Black participation in the growth and development of Wisconsin can be traced back to the 1700s when French explorers and fur traders ventured into the territory. Later, when the British gained control of the territory, blacks served as trappers, guides, and interpreters, and many blacks were assimilated within Indian tribes. Blacks played an important role in the establishment of several Wisconsin communities. Marinette, Wisconsin was settled in 1791 by two black fur traders. In the early 1840s, it was free blacks encouraged to settle in Calumet County by Moses Stanton, a black, which led to the founding in 1845 of the present city of Chilton, formerly called Stantonville. A black man named Jackson established the town of Freedom in Outagami County. Two of the largest Wisconsin farming communities which blacks pioneered before the Civil War were Cheyenne Valley Community, located in the town of Forest near Hillsborough in Vernon County, and Pleasant Ridge Community, located in B-Town near Lancaster in Grant County. The strength and prosperity of the Cheyenne Valley was based not only upon a positive economic climate, but also upon cohesiveness and integration of its social and civic institutions. The schools were completely integrated. Material support, including land and building construction, were donated by both black and white members of the community. Besides the prospect of cheap, fertile land and educational opportunities, the choice of Wisconsin as a new home may have been partially the result of the state's efforts to protect black citizens from the perils of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. 
most Wisconsinites objected to the Fugitive Slave Act, which allowed slave catchers to enter free states with the intention of capturing escaped slaves and in some instances to kidnap free blacks and return them to slave states for a life of bondage. The Wisconsin Supreme Court eventually defied the federal government by declaring the Fugitive Slave Act unconstitutional. As a result, black migration to Wisconsin increased. The early part of the century found blacks gradually settling in communities all over the state. Population figures provided by the Department of Rural Sociology at the University of Wisconsin at Madison highlight a significant trend in the growth of Wisconsin's black population. The two world wars found many southern blacks settling in the north to work in the factories. The black population grew dramatically and on the eve of the 60s, the black population approached 75,000. Then, as well as today, most Wisconsin blacks live in the urban areas of the state, and Milwaukee is still home to the state's largest black community. Although blacks in rural areas of the state were integrated into the economic fabric of the community fairly easily, blacks settling in Milwaukee faced overcrowded ghettos, low-paying, unskilled jobs, poor police relations, and a mostly segregated educational system, and as a result, discontent prevailed in Milwaukee's black community. The sad fact is that 80% of the black people in the city of Milwaukee are forced to live in a ghetto made up of about 26 census tracts. Well, what is the net result of this? Tensions grow. Youngsters go to school all the way through school now, and they don't know what white people are like. White students don't know what black students are like. Suspicions develop. There is an increasing uh, amount of harassment, hatred, that develops out of this kind of situation. It was uh, despair, for one thing, that, that developed the feeling that not too much would ever happen under the circumstances. There was disgruntlement, and of course, there was a high level of resentment. Well, I think it was an interesting mix. Um, I think we have to go back and realize that there was this great promise uh, during that period about prosperity and so forth in America. And with uh, TVs bursting out all over with the good life and so forth, and people were sitting there looking at all of these things on television and then looking at their surroundings and seeing a great uh, difference between what they saw there and what their lives actually meant. See, for a person that lives in a suburban area, it is most difficult to understand that those who do not, do not have air conditioning, those who do not, do not have bread to feed their families, and there's nothing more devastating than a father to have four or five kids and do not know where he's going to get not only a job, but the next couple of meals to feed those five kids. Well, I think uh, perhaps when I look back on the period, one of the things I see was a people struggling for a voice and an opportunity to be heard uh, uh, about their concerns and, and their lives. And uh, I think that was a theme to me that came out of the 60s in this community. Much of the discontent centered around unemployment. The lack of jobs paying livable wages threatened to undermine the black community's stability, so the demand for jobs grew louder. A close analysis of the labor market conditions in the early 60s reveals a pattern of exclusion that kept blacks in low-paying, menial work. Almost 25% of Milwaukee black families earned less than poverty-level income in the 60s. The black labor force was largely unskilled and semi-skilled. Wesley Scott, director of Milwaukee's Urban League, explains. Because uh, it reflected, of course, the job opportunities that were made available to, to blacks in the community. Primarily, they were training to refine the lack of skills that people had to make blacks eligible for merely entry-level jobs. And there was no opportunity, no wide range of opportunities for uh, gaining technical skills, the kinds of things that people needed in order to enter the, into the mainstream. Milwaukee blacks began voicing concerns about the high rate of unemployment. While many felt conditions were worsening, city and state officials were contemplating cuts in already limited services. Blacks spoke out against these cuts. In jobs now, we work with men and women who are released from correctional institutions to change their negative attitudes, to find jobs for them or to get them into training so that they can enter the economic mainstream of the state of Wisconsin. When you cut off funds for that kind of program, 
that is precisely what is meant by being penny wise and dollar foolish. I represent a middle class constituency, the, the middle man that's been squeezed pretty hard in the past. A man who is, quite frankly, concerned about the ever increasing tax burden that's falling on him. A man that uh, can bring home barely enough dollars to pay off his small mortgage, which is a lot larger than he wants it to be, to provide for uh, his family as you want to provide for yours. And consequently, he's faced with a sales tax or an income tax increase which he doesn't want, which he can't afford. And he can't rustle up a few bucks once in a while to take his family to something enjoyable and to have a pleasure in life. These are the people that, that we're attempting to represent, not the country clubbers and not the, the fat cats, but the guy that's in the middle, the guy that's been squeezed and squeezed tough with the taxes that have been befallen him. And there's not one of those men or women that don't perfectly sympathize with your action and wish that they could do something to alleviate the problem that you have. If you're so concerned about your middle class people, drop down a step to the poor class people and then put your concern on their part. Black leaders increased their efforts to provide jobs for the poor. We did the same thing that we Durban League always has done. We recruited, we trained, we approached training uh, sources encourage the participation, uh, the involvement of blacks in the training programs, encourage the participation of the recruiting of, of black teachers as, and black instructors as role images, role models. Um, and uh, sometimes we jumped up and down in order to make things happen. And then we began to approach small businessmen to hire these young people. Then we began to have these young people to understand that they could go on and become businessmen instead of just uh, being a mechanic on a franchise. Um, we we uh, discovered career clusters and we began to show them how they work up the ladder to it and we showed them how to take these jobs that was given for the wrong reason and utilize them as a good work experience. So we were satisfied that we were able to get some jobs by our demands but we were unhappy that it was for the wrong reason. President Johnson's war on poverty eventually channeled funds to the nation's cities for a variety of job programs Although some people complained that the jobs were dead end and designed to keep people off the streets, many people benefited from the training opportunities. Others acquired skills that led to a career of their choice. Although President Johnson's job programs were a welcome sign, they fell far short of ending unemployment in Milwaukee's black community, especially black youth unemployment. Well, we were uh, responsible for probably the largest youth employment programs during the 60s. Uh, but even with that, those employment programs probably only covered about 15% of the uh, youth who were interested in working and eligible for employment because our resources were that limited. And that was the largest youth programs. Um, the youth programs are, are means and were a means in the 60s of providing some money for kids and giving them some constructive activities. 